Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, welcome to this new nature webinar uh, where we are going to discuss current evidence based management of RDS in preterm newborns. Uh, my name is Dr. Yasim Sood and I'm consultant neonatologist in Shifa International Hospital, Islamabad. And with me, Dr. Efra Aslam, she's our chief resident and she's going to facilitate question and answer sessions at the end. There's nothing to disclose. Uh, before we start the presentation, I'll just briefly introduce uh, myself, my background, and uh, some uh, clinical experience. Uh, so I'm a graduate of King Edward Medical College from 2003, and then I did FCPS from Children's Hospital Hall in 2009. And then from 2009 till uh, September last year, I was in the UK. Uh, I did higher specialist training in pediatrics and neonatology, and then worked as a consultant neonatologist in St. Mary's Hospital, Manchester. Uh, this is one of the biggest centers in the UK with about 10,000 deliveries a year. And during this period, I gained uh, extensive experience in managing uh, newborns, uh, which included our day-to-day -day, uh, standard preterm newborn babies, and also specialist, uh, uh, medical specialists like uh, endocrine, metabolic, uh, neurology, nephrology, gastroenterology, cardiology, uh, all those babies who needed a neonatal intensive care due to underlying uh, specialist medical problems. And along with that, most of the work also included looking after pre-operative and post-operative surgical newborns. Uh, the purpose of today's pre uh, presentation is uh, to talk about uh, how uh, currently the RDS is being managed uh, in developed countries and how we can and uh, use those guidelines uh, in a resource limited uh, country like Pakistan. Um, I'm sure most of us know that Pakistan has one of the highest neonatal mortality rates in Pakistan and preterm and low birth weight babies, they make a big chunk of those babies. And RDS is one of the biggest uh, reason for uh, death in preterm and low birth weight newborns. So what we will do today is We'll discuss what is RDS. Uh, we'll discuss uh, how the perinatal care should be optimized uh, in these uh, uh, in these uh, women. Uh, we'll discuss what is the current recommendation for delivery room stabilization, and then we'll discuss surfactant therapy, different methods how to give surfactant, and then finally we'll touch uh, on uh, non-invasive and invasive uh, mechanical ventilation strategies in uh, RDS. We'll also discuss the role of sportive medical treatment in RDS, which includes caffeine, role of uh, postnatal steroids, and then sportive care, including thermoregulation, uh, fluid management, uh, anotropic sport, uh, role of antibiotics, pain, and sedation. So what is RDS? Uh, so um, it's also uh, called surfactant deficient lung disease. Uh, so uh, surfactant is produced uh, in the lungs uh, to and it reduces the surface tension of the at the level of the alveoli and the surfactant deficiency in preterm babies leads to pulmonary insufficiency soon after birth um, if we look at the Laplace law which is pressure is equal to two times surface tension divided by radius if due to surfactant deficiency the surface tension is high and the alveoli are collapsed the pressure which is needed to keep these alveoli open is, is quite high. And that what, what causes the uh, respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, the patient develops hypoxemia, hypercarbia, uh, desaturations, this progressive alveolar collapse and atelectasis. And if left untreated, it will lead to respiratory failure. Uh, the classic picture of ground glass appearance in uh, RDS uh, is rarely seen in the West today. And that is uh, not only because of good antenatal care, but also because of early surfactant administration and early administration of non-invasive ventilation, mainly CPAP. However, off and on we do see such X-rays, but in Pakistan we see such X-rays quite often. So how common is RDS? Uh, the incidence uh, understandably increases with increase, uh, decreasing gestational age. So at a gestational age of 26 weeks and less, uh, there's almost 95 to 100% uh, chance that the baby will develop RDS. 
uh, at 28 weeks of gestation, the incidence is reduced to 80%. And then you can see between 28 weeks and 32 weeks, there's dramatic reduction in the incidence, which is 25% at 32 weeks, and then 5% at 34 weeks. And less than 1% babies will develop RDS at term. So you can see that uh, between 28 and 34 weeks, there is a significant reduction in the incidence of uh, RDS. So the, the treatment for RDS starts even before the baby is born. So good perinatal and prenatal care is important. Unfortunately, despite all the advances in obstetric care, still there is no effective way to prevent preterm birth. Once a lady has gone into preterm labor, there is little uh, obstetric, uh, obstetric colleagues can do to uh, prevent it from happening. Um, the few things which have been tried, but there's no consensus on use of these. So some people use either oral or vaginal progesterone to uh, delay the preterm labor. Um, in women with a history of recurrent preterm labor, cervical length assessment is quite a useful tool. And those women who have a shortened uh, cervical length, uh, who are at increased risk of repeated preterm labors, they sometimes are offered cervical cerclage to prevent future preterm pregnancies. Fibronectin in uh, urine, this is a chemical uh, test, a biochemical test, which uh, uh, which can tell whether a woman is actually in preterm labor or not. So if the urine fibronectin is positive, uh, that uh, almost confirms that uh, the preterm labor is imminent within the next 24 to 48 hours. And that will give enough time to the obstetricians and the neonatal teams to prepare for the preterm delivery. Tocolytics are uh, routinely used like calcium channel blockers to, uh, to prevent the progression of the preterm labor. And uh, all women who are in threatened preterm labor, if they're not in the specialist center, the current advice is that they should be, if possible, should be transferred to a specialist center where there is on-site uh, NICU facilities. So antenatal steroids. Um, this is one of the interventions which has made a huge uh, difference to the outcome of preterm babies. Uh, uh, if you look at the Cochrane database, the, the, the nomogram of the Cochrane is actually based on the randomized control trial, which showed uh, an impressive uh, effect of antenatal steroids on the outcome of preterm babies. So the current advice is that any woman uh, presenting in preterm labor under 34 weeks should have a course of antenatal steroids. And the steroids which can be used are either dexamethasone or uh, um, uh, the other one is... Um, uh, which one is the other one? Dexamethasone and uh, no. um, dexamethasone and uh, there's another one I've just forgotten the name, uh, which is routinely used uh, in uh, women who are in preterm labor. Uh, if uh, more than a week has passed before the last course of steroid, then one uh, more uh, uh, course of steroids can be given as well. So two courses of steroids are allowed before 34 weeks of gestation. Uh, magnesium sulfate is now uh, routinely recommended in uh, all women with uh, preterm labor under 32 weeks and the uh, magnesium sulfate is uh, believed to be neuroprotective and in improves the neurological outcome of uh, preterm babies. Uh, so one dose of magnesium sulfate is, I don't think it's a very expensive drug and I think most of the centers now have started using magnesium sulfate uh, in, in preterm babies. Uh, the steroid, the other steroid which is used along with dexamethasone is betamethasone. So either de dexamethasone or betamethasone, they can be used uh, as antenatal steroids. Uh, magnesium sulfate should be offered to all women in preterm labor under 32 weeks. And then the commonest reason for women uh, for going into preterm labor is uh, infection or sepsis. So all these women should be offered uh, IV antibiotics. And then obviously, uh, the neonatal team should be informed that uh, preterm uh, delivery is expected. So these are some of the things uh, which, if done promptly and in time, will improve the outcome of a preterm baby and improve the outcome from an RDS point of view. So what happens inside the room where the baby is born? This can either be an operating theater or it can be a delivery room. The few things which are now standard in all preterm deliveries 
and delayed cord clamping uh, is now uh, almost routinely practiced in most of the centers and it is recommended that 60 seconds of uh, delayed cord clamping should be done in preterm newborns unless they are in need of immediate newborn resuscitation which is very unusual because most of the uh, preterm babies they don't need resuscitation they just need stabilization so uh, wherever possible uh, at least 60 seconds of delayed cord clamping should be performed and that has shown to uh, improve uh, the need for uh, subsequent transfusions and overall improved outcome in preterm babies the other important thing which starts uh, state uh, state after birth and even before birth is the importance of maintaining uh, a normal temperature so the normal temperature should be maintained which is 36.5 to 37.5 and the baby should be placed under a radiant heater and uh, under 32 weeks all babies should be delivered straight into a polythene bag and when that bag is uh, placed under the radiant heater then that prevents the uh, heat loss from the baby and maintains the temperature at the same time it should be a standard practice that all babies should have a, a hat or a head cap placed straight after birth because of the large surface area from the head a huge amount of heat is lost from the head and this is what i've seen uh, after coming back to pakistan as well that this was not a routine practice uh, and i think that if we want to improve our temperature control in these preterm babies polythene bag and uh, hat should be used uh, as a standard practice right from birth and these are very cheap uh, modalities uh, we are we have started using ordinary polythene bags which you can get from supermarkets and normal woolen hats the next uh, thing is um, the respiratory support so the the current advice is that we should start with uh, non invasive respiratory support wherever wherever possible uh, the preferred mode in uh, small babies especially less than 30 weeks is uh, to start on cpap uh, in the delivery suite and in bigger babies, we can start with the uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen. But this is for the babies who are otherwise well, who have good respiratory effort uh, and are not in need of immediate resuscitation, which will be a case for majority of our preterm newborns. However, there will be some babies who are born in poor condition and will need help or resuscitation. And these are the babies who should be given uh, positive pressure ventilation. Some of them uh, might improve and may not need intubation but there will be some preterm babies, especially those who are very early, uh, like 24, 25 week preterm babies who are going to need intubation. And if a baby preterm baby is intubated in the delivery room, then it should be a standard practice that they're given surfactant there and then. Uh, during uh, stabilization, the current recommendations are that uh, under 28 weeks, uh, we should start the resuscitation in 30% FAO2 and below uh, and over 28 weeks, the resuscitation should be started in air. And then the FIO2 should be told, uh, titrated based on the saturation monitoring and the saturation probe should be placed in the right arm, which will give us pre-ductal saturation monitoring. So these are the few uh, things uh, which should happen in the delivery room, uh, delayed cord clamping, uh, temperature control, non-invasive respiratory support and intubation where, uh, where needed. And surfactant should be given if the baby needs intubation. And the FIO2 should be maintained uh, to uh, target uh, about 93 to 94% preductal saturation in the, in the right arm. So moving on, uh, when to give surfactant? Uh, so currently there are only two indications and, that's, and this is according to the European Consensus 2019 guidelines. And, and the two indications to give surfactant are that if the baby is intubated in the delivery room, uh, then we will give surfactant and the other indication is that a baby has been started on non-invasive respiratory support uh, which is either CPAP or high flow nasal cannula oxygen and that baby is showing signs of clinical deterioration the FIO2 is increasing the blood gases are not good there's increased work of breathing the chest x-ray shows more due to severe RDS and so these are the babies who should be given surfactant so if you're talking about absolute indications based on the current evidence then these are the only two indications to give surfactant However, uh, some units in the UK and Europe uh, will still give uh, prophylactic surfactant, especially uh, in, those, in the babies who are uh, very, very uh, preterm, extreme preterms, and that includes babies under 25, 26 weeks. So some units at 23, 24 weeks will routinely give surfactant, and that's because at this gestation, 
um, if you start with NI NIV, uh, there's still a significant chance that the baby will need uh, mechanical ventilation or surfactant. And to avoid that situation, uh, some people prefer that they can give prophylactic surfactant and then uh, aim for extubation uh, as soon as possible. Now, if what uh, we do in Pakistan, uh, the problem is because the NIV is still not uh, uh, effective. NIV is still not available, uh, especially if we talk about uh, delivery room NIV. I think there are only one or two centers in Pakistan which can offer NIV right from the birth in the delivery suite. Uh, in most cases, um, the, the non-emergency ventilation is started while the baby is transferred to the unit. So I think from uh, our point of view, uh, we should uh, perhaps consider uh, giving uh, a prophylactic surfactant uh, around at the under 28, 30 weeks, especially if the chest X issue was more due to severe RDS. And in those cases where women have not received antenatal steroids, because if the women have not received antenatal steroids, we don't have the facility to give effective NIV. And in those cases, it's better to uh, give uh, surfactant and then aim for early extubation onto the non-invasive respiratory support. But if you talk about, uh, if you talk about the uh, international consensus, then the indications are only two, as I mentioned earlier. So this is the flow diagram, which shows uh, how the RDS should be managed. And this is again, uh, the, based on the current evidence. So if you have preterm neonate uh, who is at risk of RDS, if the baby needs uh, ventilation in the, in the delivery suite, the baby is born in poor condition and needs surfactant, then, then that baby should receive surfactant there and then. However, uh, if uh, the baby is born in good condition with good respiratory effort, then and the standard advice is that we should start NIV and provide good supportive care and keep the baby warm. And that NIV could either be CPAP or high flow nasal canal oxygen. And then what happens next? There will be some babies who remain very well on uh, NIV. The FAO2 remains less than 30%. In these babies will continue with NIV and continue to monitor. But some of these babies will, uh, some of these babies uh, will then uh, start showing signs of uh, increasing FIO2 requirement, uh, uh, abnormal blood gases with pH less than 7.2 and CO2 above 50 to 60 millimeter of mercury, which is 6.5 to 6, 8 kilopascal. So this is then the indication to give surfactant uh, plus minus ventilation. When I say plus minus ventilation, that's because some babies, if they're given surfactant by a LISA method, then they might not need ventilation. They will just receive the surfactant, but there will be some babies um, who will need ventilation, especially if the RDS is very severe or if the facility to give LISA is not available. Those babies will need surfactant and ventilation. How we give surfactant? Um, the traditional method uh, obviously is intubation uh, using an endotracheal tube and then giving the surfactant. Uh, um, the other method, which I think probably is more useful for inborn babies in Pakistan is ensure that we give the surfactant and then extubate the baby onto NIV as soon as possible. Uh, Insure in was not very um, uh, commonly used in the UK. Uh, the preferred method was either uh, giving surfactant at the time of intubation or, or LISA. So what is LISA? So LISA has uh, be, um, becoming more and more, uh, uh, in, it's coming into practice more and more now, uh, less in, invas invasive surfactant administration and what happens is the baby stays on non-invasive respiratory support, which is either CPAP or uh, nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula. And as soon as the clinicians feel that uh, the FIO2 on uh, non-invasive respiratory support is touching 30%, or if the blood gases are showing respiratory acidosis, uh, they can give surfactant using a catheter, but the baby does not need intubation. So the baby stays on the non-invasive respiratory support. I think in Pakistan we have started using in some centers, but it is not a routine practice now. Uh, and that is because we don't have very good NIV facilities. For LISA to work, we need to make sure that uh, the babies are good, receiving good NIV support right from birth. Uh, and only then you can use LISA and only then you can avoid mechanical ventilation. Uh, nebulized surfactant is currently in research, um, but I'm, I think in the coming years, uh, this might become uh, uh, another form of uh, surfactant administration method. 
the target saturation should be 90 to 94 percent uh, after the baby has been stabilized initially and alarm limits therefore should be set at 89 to 95 percent and this is to make sure that we don't give too much oxygen because of the risk of uh, retinopathy of prematurity so talking about non-invasive respiratory support uh, as i mentioned it should start soon after birth especially under 32 to 32 weeks uh, if the baby is over 32 weeks and if there are no signs of respiratory distress and the mother has received antenatal steroids, it's possible that some of these babies might not need any respiratory support. But under 32 weeks, most babies are likely to uh, need uh, respiratory support. And um, in terms of uh, options for NIV, we can either use CPAP or we can use heated humidified high flow nasal candle oxygen. Uh, CPAP has been a traditional non-invasive respiratory support uh, for years and uh, uh, it's more useful now for babies who are small so especially under 28 to 30 weeks uh, and high flow nasal candle oxygen which is uh, now becoming increasingly popular uh, is uh, at the moment is more uh, used for slightly bigger babies uh, who are above 28 to 30 weeks uh, however there are some centers uh, in 12 countries who are using uh, high flow nasal candle oxygen in the delivery suite and in, in more smaller babies uh, the current evidence uh, is there was a hipster trial which was done in Australia and that showed that pro preferably it's better to use in slightly bigger babies above 30 weeks because they found that when used in under 30 weeks and smaller babies, the outcomes were slightly poor compared to CPAP. So as we speak, until the more evidence becomes available, CPAP should be used for smaller babies and high flow nasal cannula oxygen should be used for bigger babies. So what can we do in Pakistan? So I think that um, most of our focus needs to be on uh, 28 weeks onwards because we still have a very high mortality uh, uh, even at these gestation, especially if we talk about government hospitals because of the lack of good NICU facilities and lack of good uh, perinatal and antenatal care. So even our 28, 29, 30 week babies are not surviving. So what we need to do is probably focus in the first instance on these babies, uh, which are slightly bigger. And for these babies, probably high flow nasal cannula oxygen probably will be a better option than, than the CPAP. And it's cheaper as well compared to CPAP. The circuit is cheaper, the interface is cheaper. And overall, uh, the equipment uh, can be manufactured even uh, locally as well. So. Uh, I feel that for our patient population, high flow nasal cannula oxygen is probably a better option uh, than, than CPAP. But this is something that we, we can always discuss. Uh, for CPAP, the interface should either be a, a short uh, by nasal prongs or mask, and the starting uh, pressure should be uh, from five to eight centimeters of water. And for high flow nasal cannula, the interface is always nasal prongs. Uh, and the flow is uh, from two to eight liter per minute. The recommendations are to start from about four liter per minute, and then uh, we can go up to eight liters if required. Um, the cannulas which are used for high flow nasal cannula, it's called RAM cannula, and uh, it's really, really, uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, safety of this cannula, even in Britain babies uh, who have very soft skin, we see very few nasal injuries uh, with the use of high flow nasal cannula. So uh, bubble CPAP, this is one form of, uh, this is one method of delivering CPAP. We didn't use it in the UK. In the UK, we mainly used uh, floor drivers, but uh, in, uh, in resource limited settings, uh, bubble CPAP can be used. Uh, this is the bottle uh, that is, uh, that will determine the, the column of uh, water that how deep the tube is will determine how much pressure will be generated. This is the humidifier, which will make sure that all the air which is going to the baby is warm, is warmed and humidified. And these are the expiratory limbs and the, and the cannulas. Uh, so it's quite, um, uh, if compared with, uh, with floor drivers, it's, it's much cheaper. Uh, but uh, it's important to know that the flow has to be around five to eight liters. And for that flow to work, we need to have a humidifier so that uh, uh, the air and oxygen is, is humidified, uh, humidified and, um, and warmed. And these are the infant flow driver CPAPs, and this one can give CPAP and BiPAP as well. 
uh, and then this one is uh, this one is used in uh, some centers in Pakistan. Uh, this is from a company called Madden uh, CNO, uh, and that that's another form of infant flow uh, driver. And this is the, how the high flow nasal cannula work. Uh, in Shifa, we have started making uh, this from uh, our own equipment. So instead of getting a proper machine, what we are doing is we are using a uh, with the help of our uh, colleagues from the bi biomedical department, we're using a gas blender uh, and a humidifier and a circuit. So all we need three things. We need a gas blender, which is usually available in most NSUs. We need a humidifier, and then we need a circuit and the cannula at the end. So we need four things. This is what we have seen is much cheaper than the than the CPAP. Uh, and as I said earlier, is preferably more useful for slightly bigger babies, which make a major proportion of our patient population. And these are the devices which are, uh, uh, you can say, um, ready-made uh, high-flow nasal cannula devices. So AVO is available in Pakistan. Beputham is, again, uh, quite commonly used in, in the West. Uh, uh, the principle remains the same as, as I showed that you need a blender, a humidifier, and a circuit. So this is just a um, like a ready-made device. These are expensive, obviously. So, as I said, high flow nasal cannula can be used either as a, uh, it can be used as a primary respiratory support in bigger babies, but in smaller babies, it can be used either as a step down from the CPAP or after extubation. Uh, if the FAO2 on the NIV reaches 30%, then at that point, uh, the baby should receive surfactant plus minus ventilation. And uh, in, there is very clear evidence now that the standard treatment these days should be CPAP with early rescue surfactant, which uh, should be the standard for all babies with RDS. So that means we start off with CPAP and then give surfactant if required. So moving on to the uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, under 28 weeks, uh, almost 50% of babies uh, will need ventilation. So even though we start them on NIVs, about 50% will then have increasing oxygen requirement and suboptimal gases needing ventilation. And what we're going to achieve from mechanical ventilation is acceptable blood gases, avoid lung injury, uh, inflate at the electric lung, and prevent over distension. Um, the volume targeted ventilation is now the preferred uh, mode for mechanical ventilation in, in RDS. Uh, and what happens in volume targeted ventilation is that uh, we set a tidal volume of four to six mls per kilogram and then the machine or the ventilator will decide how much pressure it will need to give to achieve that tidal volume and in rds as we know that as soon as we give the surfactant the compliance of the lung improves uh, quite dramatically so the benefit of using volume targeted ventilation is that the pip generator will automatically be uh, as the compliance improves and once the blood gases are acceptable on 4 mls per uh, kilogram of tidal volume and the PIP generated is low and good saturations, then we can extubate. Um, and volume targeted ventilation can be used with uh, uh, commonly used pressure control uh, ventilation modes like SMV or cyst control. Uh, pressure control ventilation modes are either uh, SMV or cyst control. Uh, these both are uh, uh, time cycled pressure limited uh, mechanical ventilation modes. Uh, assist control uh, along with volume targeted ventilation uh, as a primary mode of ventilation is uh, used as first line in most of the centers in the UK. Uh, and the benefit of using assist control with, uh, uh, with the volume target ventilation is that, that uh, there is automatic weaning uh, because most all the breaths are being supported by the ventilator uh, and there's automatic weaning of the peak inspiratory pressure. Uh, and for patients who have good respiratory effort, once the baby has um, acceptable gases on minimal FAO2 uh, and the PIP required to generate a tidal volume of four ml per kilogram is minimal, then we can consider um, uh, extubation. Not going to go into much details of mechanical ventilation uh, as such, because that's a, hu a huge topic of discussion in, it, in its own right. Uh, but the message I want to give is that the current recommendations are that we use uh, volume targeted ventilation as a primary mode of ventilation, which can be used with assist control or SMV modes. Some babies with uh, severe RDS uh, will need high frequency ventilation as well, but th that proportion is very low. 
and still the the guidelines are that this should be used as a rescue therapy not as a primary mode of uh, ventilation uh, in terms of weaning and extubation uh, again depends on the degree of severity the patients who uh, have severe rds where the mother didn't receive uh, uh, antithelial steroids and especially uh, what i have seen in pakistan is the babies who are outborn and are then transferred into the nicu they take longer uh, on the ventilation because of the uh, because the disease process has gone further uh, uh, before they have come to the nicu um, so the weaning should be done weaning should be done based on the clinical uh, status of the patient uh, the pressure should be weaned the volume if you're using volume target ventilation the target volume should be weaned slowly and that should be guided by the uh, blood gases saturation monitoring fio2 and once once everything is stable on minimal fio2 then the trial of extubation onto the non invasive respiratory support should be given uh, again we should not be uh, aiming to achieve normal blood gases in these preterm babies because their uh, their pathology is very different and as long as the ph is maintained above 7.20 we will accept a ph of uh, about 50 to 60 mm of mercury uh, which is 7 to 8 kilo uh, kilo pascals so that's uh, something we call permissive hypercarbia and uh, what we are trying to achieve is to limit the degree of uh, barotrauma and volume trauma from the ventilation and to reduce the incidence of chronic lung disease. Uh, caffeine, uh, there's clear evidence from the CAP trial that uh, caffeine uh, not only helps with early year extubation, it also reduces the uh, incidence of chronic lung disease and better neurodevelopmental outcomes. So the standard practice now is that all babies under 34 weeks at admission should be started on caffeine. Um, the loading dose is 20 milligram per kilogram of caffeine citrate and then 5 to 10 milligram per kg per day as maintenance and that should be continued until 34 uh, weeks of collected gestation. Um, again, there's a quite uh, significant role of postnatal steroids, especially in extreme preterm babies who are at risk of uh, chronic lung disease. Uh, so any baby who is still on the ventilator uh, after one to two weeks should be considered for postnatal steroids with the aim of uh, extubation earlier uh, and to reduce the incidence of chronic lung disease. It shouldn't be used within the first week and should be considered after the, uh, after the second, around uh, day 10 to day 14. And, but before giving um, uh, steroids, we need to make sure that uh, there's no infection and the PDA is not contributing to the ventilation requirements. And if we are satisfied that and uh, there's no infection, the PDA is small, and but the baby is still ventilator dependent, then uh, uh, dexamethasone can be used uh, as a post steroid. And the commonly used regime is called DART regime, which use very low dose dexamethasone uh, over a course of 10 days. Uh, not all the babies who are on the ventilator will need uh, sedation, uh, only selected babies uh, uh, should be considered for morphine or fentanyl uh, again and again uh, as we anticipate that most of these babies will not be on the ventilator for a long time um, midazolam should not be used uh, for short-term ventilation and if needed morphine or fentanyl should be used so the routine use of uh, opiates or midazolam uh, in ventilator preterm units is, is not recommended um, Along with the, uh, this, the good monitoring and good supportive care is very important. Uh, the standard monitoring in modern NSUs include pulse oximetry, ECG monitoring, transcutaneous CO2 monitoring is now a standard practice and that uh, leads to reduced need to do blood gases because you can see from the skin probe that how much is the CO2. Uh, the babies who are hypotensive and ventilated should have a, 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 either a USC or a peripheral arterial line for blood pressure monitoring and there should be close monitoring of electrolytes, glucose, uh, input output, fluid balance, and weight. Uh, and there should be easy access to portable x-rays and uh, a portable head ultrasound. Uh, uh, to, and this should be 24-7 service. Uh, we discussed thermoregulation before as well, uh, but I just want to emphasize how important the thermoregulation is. And I think one of the uh, biggest reasons uh, for poor survival in our preterm babies is the lack of awareness about the importance of thermoregulation. And uh, this would have seen is that most of the babies that we receive in our uh, 
hospital who are outborn when they arrive to the hospital they are usually hypothermic and that in uh, and there's clear evidence that with each degree celsius below 36.5 the mortality for these babies increases by almost 30 percent so you can see that it's really really important that we do everything we can to make sure that the baby's temperature is maintained in the normal range uh, polythene bag and hat as i mentioned earlier should be used right from from birth or as soon as possible and for uh, preterm babies especially under 28 weeks the incubators should have the facility for a high humidity up to 70 to 80 percent to reduce insensible, insensible losses kangaroo mother care in low income countries is effective in maintaining temperature and this should also be used uh, once the baby has been stabilized on the unit that the mother should be able to come every day and spend time skin to skin uh, with their babies uh, even when they are on the ventilator or on the NIV. Uh, we used in, in the UK, the practice was to give antibiotics uh, in all babies with RDS, but we stopped them at 36 hours if there was no evidence of infection, if the blood cultures were normal and the CRPs were normal. Obviously in Pakistan, the situation is very different because we have a big challenge of neonatal sepsis and multi drug resistant sepsis. So that needs to be considered on an individual basis based on the local unit policies. Uh, in terms of uh, cardiovascular support, uh, the blood pressure should be treated in accordance with the clinical parameters like uh, capillary refill time, blood lactate levels, urine output, and all those things. And we shouldn't be treating uh, hypertension just based on the numerical value of the blood pressure. Uh, all sick neonates uh, ideally should have invasive blood pressure monitoring. Uh, and, uh, the other thing which uh, is strongly discussed is to avoid fluid boluses because uh, preterm babies or even term babies, they are never hypovolemic and they are very unlikely to need fluid boluses. Uh, if they are if they are hypertensive, then they should they sh and if there's signs uh, of effects of hypertension in the form of uh, reduced urine output or raised lactate, and then those babies should be considered uh, should be started on inotropic sport rather than giving fruit bolluses. Uh, the blood uh, hemoglobin should be maintained uh, in a decent range, uh, above 12 in ventilated and above 10 to 11 in those who, babies who are on NIV or on oxygen. Uh, it, along with the um, thermoregulation and ventilatory support, uh, good uh, fluid and nutritional support is important and IV fluid should be started as soon as possible after birth and ideally within the first hour. Uh, uh, we should carefully monitor the fluid balance, input output, weight changes, uh, blood biochemistry, which includes uh, urea, electrolytes, uh, and then manage the fluids accordingly based on based on these things. They, we can't have a single uh, formula which is applicable to every baby. So every baby is different. So the daily fluid requirement and its composition should be adjusted based on each patient. And under 1.2 kilogram and under 30 weeks, these babies should be considered for, for TPN based uh, if the facility to give TPN is available. And <coughs> express breast milk should be started as soon as possible. And I think it's important that we, when we go and see these women antenatally for antenatal counseling, uh, we should mention at that time as well that they should start expressing breast milk as soon as after birth so that as soon as the EBM is available and the baby is hemodynamically stable, we can start the uh, EBM. The aim should be to start within the first 24 hours if the baby is well. There are some other indications for surfactant use outside RDS, uh, which includes ventilated babies with severe pneumonia, uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, and meconium aspiration. So these are the conditions where we can use uh, uh, surfactant, and most of these babies will need mechanical ventilation as well, along with surfactant. So this is what uh, is, uh, is the current uh, international guidance, how we should manage RDS in preterm newborns. Uh, and obviously, then the next question is what we need to do in Pakistan because of the limited resources, lack of good NSU facilities, lack of perinatal care. So as you saw, some, thing, some of the things I mentioned, they don't need uh, uh, very expensive uh, equipment, uh, as I mentioned, or thermoregulation, temperature control. These are very basic things uh, which can be improved with very, uh, uh, very cheap uh, equipment. Uh, and as I mentioned, we should, we need, as a nation, we probably need to focus on uh, 28 weeks and above first before we move on to the lower gestations. 
because uh, as we speak, uh, our survival even at that, even at this gestation is, is still very uh, poor. So we need to focus on in the first instance from 28 weeks onwards and once we get better and those on, on uh, managing those babies, then we can move to the lower gestations and uh, focus on basics of sportive care and get better at using non-invasive ventilation. The more we can do to avoid a baby going on the ventilator, the better the outcome would be because once the baby goes on the ventilator, uh, because of the risk associated with the ventilation associated pneumonia, complications like pneumothorax and lack of expert uh, neonatal nursing care, and the outcome for these babies unfortunately becomes very poor. Therefore, anything we can do to uh, get a baby away and uh, to keep a baby away from the ventilator, that will help in improving the outcome for these babies. Uh, the other thing which I was thinking uh, that uh, in terms of improving the overall uh, uh, numbers of neonatal mortality and how we can reduce the neonatal mortality in Pakistan is that we don't have many standalone maternity hospitals with on-site uh, NSU facilities and this is something which the government needs to consider that at least in uh, the big cities there are, there are standalone maternity hospitals uh, with NSU on-site NSU facilities and most in most of the modern maternity hospitals the NSU is usually one or two minutes away from the uh, delivery suite or from the operating room so that if a baby needs NSU the baby is transferred within two to three minutes uh, and that that again improves the outcome and this is something that we need to consider and obviously uh, our term babies are still dying because of lack of uh, uh, people who can provide adequate resuscitation and uh, most of about 90% of the babies who need resuscitation they just need bag and mask ventilation less than 1% of babies will need uh, ventilation so all the healthcare providers who are dealing with newborns at the time of birth uh, they have to be skilled in providing a bag and mask ventilation and I think that is something which will improve uh, the mortality uh, for the babies who are born at term. So I think I will stop here and if there are any questions, we can take those questions and uh, you can uh, you can send the questions in the question and answer tab at the top um, and Dr. Efra will, will ask those questions. इसको बड़ा करें स्क्रीन को इस तरह इधर से देख लें सामने से। So the first question we have is what are the major causes of neonates born with uh, no spontaneous cry? So uh, the reason that the babies don't cry is because they have been born in poor conditions. So they probably have been hypoxemic for for some reason. Uh, so they have been there must be some kind of fetal distress or some kind of every. Uh, some kind of event which has caused hypoxia in the newborn. So the newborn who is not hypoxic should straight away cry after birth. So if the baby doesn't cry after birth, that means that that baby is hypoxic. And because of the hypoxia, they're not crying. And what that baby needs is a bag and mask ventilation to uh, increase the uh, oxygen in the fetal circulation. And once the oxygenated blood starts going into the lungs and into the heart, then the baby will start crying. So that's why we say that the majority of the focus on newborn resuscitation should be on effective bag and mask ventilation so that that hypoxic baby who is not crying because his lungs have not inflated properly can his lungs are inflated and he can start crying. Now another question we have is what is the window period for the babies to develop irreversible brain injury due to the lack of spontaneous cry? Uh, I don't think there's any uh, clear time period uh, that we can say that after this period, uh, the, there will be irreversible brain injury. But if a baby is still needing resuscitation by 20, 30 minutes of age, then by that time, we would say that probably the irreversible brain injury has happened. But again, there is no set rule uh, as such. So there's another question. How can caffeine play a role in neurodevelopment? Uh, again, the exact mechanism is not clear, but uh, from the CAP trial, the evidence was very clear that the neurodevelopmental outcome in babies who received caffeine, the outcome was much better in those babies. If the baby at 30 weeks gestation is delivered via lower cesarean section due to maternal preeclampsia, 
what are the chances of such baby surviving in a tertiary care and icu given that the baby has improved a bit after the surfactant therapy so at 30 weeks uh, uh, if the weight is good and the baby has been given surfactant then the outcome and the survival is almost 100% but that again depends on the good nicu facilities uh, one uh, att attendee has basically requested a lecture on mechanical ventilation mm -hmm. and then we have another question asking what is the dose of surfactant okay so the dose of surfactant if if you're using a prophylactic surfactant uh, prophylactic surfactant like you're using for very preterm babies like 24 25 weeks then the dose is 100 uh, milligram per kilogram which is uh, about 1.25 ml per kilogram but if you're using it as a rescue treatment which is now the standard advice to give as rescue then the dose is 200 milligram per kilogram which is 2.5 ml per kilogram what is DART regime? So DART regime is basically a regime of uh, low dose dexamethasone. Uh, you can get the details from the Google, but it's a, a, a low dose dexamethasone over a course of 10 days. Uh, if a baby is delivered with meconium aspiration syndrome, when should we administer surfactant? So if the baby with meconium aspiration is on the mechanical ventilator, then the surfactant should be considered. But if they are on the NIV and they're not on the ventilator, then they don't need surfactant. What weight is considered safe zone for 30 weeks babies? So for 30 weeks babies, the safe zone would be 1.5 kilogram. Another request on the lecture on meconium aspiration syndrome. Mm -hmm. Then we have uh, pulmonary hemorrhage was mentioned in other indications of surfactant administration. Mm -hmm. Isn't it rather a contraindication of surfactant administration? No, the pulmonary hemorrhage, because what one happens is once there is pulmonary hemorrhage that inactivates the uh, surfactant. So uh, a higher dose of surfactant is used in babies with pulmonary hemorrhage. Would it be all right to give surfactant at third day of life? Uh, that's uh, probably a difficult question to answer, but depends. Uh, as I said, the indications are that if the FA2 is reaching 30%, you should give surfactant. But uh, I would say in the first in the, in the first 72 hours, if at any point that happens, then you will have to give uh, surfactant. So I would say first 72 hours you can use, but my, most of my experience has been giving surfactant mainly within the first 48 hours. What medications are used as surfactant? Um, the medicine that we use is Curoserf, which is made by Kaisi. At what age of gestation, maximum chances of respiratory distress syndrome and how can it be prevented antenatally? So the, as I showed in one of the slides that uh, at 26 weeks and below the RDS incidence is about 80%. Uh, then we have, what is the best mode of ventilation in RDS? So the best mode of ventilation in RDS, as I mentioned, is volume targeted ventilation with assist control. If a baby survives RDS, then what's the major killer of uh, prematurity? The, the major killer of uh, prematurity is still the RDS and uh, if the baby survives RDS, then it's the sepsis, I think, and the uh, uh, poor nutrition. Uh, but after RDS, it's the neonatal sepsis, which is the major killer for these babies. Okay. Is there any difference in antenatal dexamethasone or betamethasone? Uh, I don't think so, no. All right. uh, should a baby with neonatal pneumonia maintaining SATs on vent? It's not a question. <laughs> Uh, why should we allow the pH to remain acidic? How will it impact the neonate? Why should we allow the pH to maintain? So the pH, uh, the pH has to be maintained above 7.20 because what uh, the reason for uh, saying that is that when they found was that all systems uh, are working in. Uh, so if the pH is 7.20, it is acidic, but. Uh, the heart, the gut, and other organs, they keep working as normal uh, as long as the pH doesn't drop below 7.20. So this is the evidence from research that as long as the pH is maintained above 7.20, uh, that should be acceptable. So they're asking about a percentile value for RDS and C-section ratio of any kind. So, uh, so what was the question? Ratio of uh, respiratory distress ratio syndrome in C-section. In C-section. So in C-section as such, we don't see RDS as such. The condition that we see in C-section is transient kidney of the newborn. And the, uh, I mean, the current recommendations are that the elective C-section should not be performed bef be before 39 weeks. Uh, and if the C-section is performed at 39 weeks, the chances of RDS are low, but we can still see some babies with transient kidney of the newborn.
if we are considering sepsis in neonates with RDS, what would be the major pathogens? Um, depends. Uh, in the first uh, 24, 48 hours, it will be usually E. coli and group B strep. But after uh, 72 hours, they usually are uh, gram-negative sepsis and the hospital-acquired infections. If a baby survives RDS, and what is the major? Mm. We've covered that. Is CPAP better in RDS? Uh, yes, that's what we have said. That for especially for smaller babies, uh, CPAP should be the standard, uh, and high flow nasal cannula in in bigger babies. Okay, I think that's uh, the end of this session. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, for joining. And uh, uh, with this, we'll uh, say thank you to everyone. Uh, Allah Hafiz. Assalamualaikum.